Good morning. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, it's an honor to be here today because HBO is a great partner. At Lionsgate, we aspire to make noisy, platform-defining TV shows that break out of the clutter and get noticed. HBO not only aspires to this goal, they deliver on it every single time. As you all know, HBO is the home of edgy and groundbreaking programs like Girls, as well as Flight of the Concords, Veep, and Silicon Valley. So we're very pleased to have here this morning Casey Bloys, President of Programming for HBO, and Jenny Connor, Writer, Director, and Executive Producer of Girls. Casey is the key tastemaker at HBO developing all of their programming, series, movies, specials, and talk shows. And Jenny is a talented showrunner who started her career on Judd Apatow's Undeclared and is co-founder with Lena Dunham of their production banner, A Casual Romance Productions. We're very happy to have them both for today's comedy masterclass. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Casey Bloys and Jenny Connor. I know. So when I found out this was called a master class, I thought we better prepare. Yeah. Um, I found out yesterday it was called a master class. <laughs> um, so uh, Jenny and I have been working together since the pilot of Girls, which was seven years ago now. Yeah. Um, and Jenny has not seen this, but I, it's, kind of, it, it's hard to believe that uh, this is, we're in the final, final stages of, the last, of filming the last season Half of Girls. I still feel like we're talking about the pilot. It's, it's crazy. So Jenny has not seen this, but I'm going to show you all a, um, a I guess you say, greatest hits. I, I asked our team to put together some nice moments from girls. Jenny hasn't seen it. My goal is to make her cry and I'm, weep. I'm a pretty easy um, cry. So we're going to take a look at this, and then we'll come back. I'm going to do some questions. You can ask me some questions, okay. and then I think we'll open it up to you guys. Uh, uh, for questions as All well. All of my questions to you are just going to be about if you're picking up our other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do it. We'll do it here on stage. That's all right. Uh, okay, so let's show. This is a uh, girl's, you know, uh, greatest hits from past seasons. So sweet. Wasn't that nice? I love that. Um, I'm sure you've been asked this before. I know I have, but because it's a master class, let's talk about yeah. it. Um, did you have a sense, you know, when we're doing the pilot, did you have any sense that it would be, I guess, the cultural lightning rod that it was, or, or the show and or Lena both? Um, I mean, you sort of have to be a sociopath to like actually think it's gonna be like that. <laughs> but uh, I, you know, I saw Tiny Furniture before I ever met Lena, and I was so obsessed with it. and because I had never seen anything like it. I had never seen a voice like hers before. You know, doing, I mean, in Tiny Furniture, it's like, she was so unapologetic. The character is such an asshole to her parents. <laughs> she won't take out the garbage, she won't do anything. She's a brat. She's mean to her friends. <laughs> she, you know, puts on spanks for a, like a minute and a half in a scene. <laughs> it, it was just like, I had never seen anything like that, that like level of truth. And it, I connected to it being a million years older than her, but I connected to it so clearly. And so I would say I didn't expect anything that came after the pilot, but I did know that there was something really magical about her voice. Did you, no, I, I'm sometimes still surprised by the intense scrutiny of her. Yes. Yeah. You know, um, like the, like, we were forced to give her her show, right. you know, or, you know, all these kind of crazy things. Yes, because her parents because were her, visual artists. Yes, exactly. Everyone knows that's the fastest route to Hollywood. <laughs> do, you have, do you have a theory as to why it's so intense on her? Um, I just think, yeah, because I think she tells the truth and that freaks people out. I, thought my, I had a theory that it was yeah, a little bit me. of a generational, sh that because she was... 20, how old was she when we started, 24? 23 when I met her, 24 when the show started. 
it does signal a little bit of a generational shift that someone who's 23 or 24, and she's unique in the ability to kind of have a voice to fill a show, yeah. um, that it's a little scary for all of us who make television. It's like, well, shit, if she can do that, what am I doing? Right. You know? yeah, I, that, I mean, that's my, that was my personal theory. I yeah, I, I certainly felt like it took me a million years to get to the place where I could write about my 20s the way she was writing about them in the moment she was living them. Yeah. Like, she would go on a date... Like, it took me 20 years to process stories from that time that I tell in the show. She would go on a date and that night go home and write a scene that was kind of like that date. Like, it's, she processes things, like, so unbelievably Yeah, quickly. it's funny. By the end of the first season, I did feel... I had the feeling that we were like, oh, wow, we used... Like, she's got to go out and live some more. I know. Right? And that's also why we, like, really depended on the writing staff as we yeah. went along, because we ran out of stories, and she, her whole life became making the show. Right. And she got a boyfriend, and we were like, this is terrible. <laughs> Not good for me. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm sure people here would be very curious about your working relationship, because I always say, you know, when you're in a job like this, you make a lot of creative marriages. It's a very hard thing to do, yeah. just like marriage in real life. Um, you I, guys have made some really good ones. We've made some good though, ones. Yeah. I will say that yours uh, is probably the best, the most harmonious, well, we'll the most Jenny fruitful. Jenny Bix and Whitney Cummings are falling in love. The, <laughs> Alec, I, and Alec Berg and Mike yes, Judge have a totally. very good yeah. uh, marriage. We're talking about the nose. Uh, yeah. But I think people would be curious to hear about how, how do you guys work together? Like, do you write in the same room together? Do you send right. each other scenes? And has it evolved from when you started to where you are now? Well, when we started... And Judd is a huge part of this as well. When we started, Lena would go off and just, like, she just wrote the pilot, like, in a fever dream, basically, and gave it to Judd and I, and it was <laughs> incredible. And we made, you know, we added some, like, I don't know, stakes, I hate using that word, but, like, Judd said, what if her parents are going to cut her off? Right. You know, things like that. Um, and, and it just added attention. But so much of that original dialogue was then, and she that uh, during the pilot, when we were in prep for the pilot, we were all staying at the same hotel. And we did kind of a mini writer's room, the three of us, to punch up the script. And Lena had never experienced writing with anyone. Right. And she was like, this is fantastic. <laughs> She's like, I have other people writing jokes? This is, really is great. And she had so much fun. And she took the one she liked and didn't take the, you know, the great news about Lena, she has the clearest voice and the clearest ear for what that voice is. and so. The reason I think the show continues to feel so authentically like her voice when we have so many different writers is just because she knows what it is so right. clearly. And, um, and then as we progressed, you know, I, Lena was truly terrified of the writer's room at the very beginning. I mean, it was entirely people older than her. Yeah. And everyone had more experience than her. And she was so used to being solitary, and she thought that's what writing was. And she would literally, it would be like noon, and she'd be like, I think we're done here, you guys. <laughs> she, we make fun of her because she would always say, I think we got a lot of great work here done today. <laughs> and it was like literally 10.30 in the morning. We'd be like, let's just go a little further. And now she like, you know, worships the room and uses it as well as anyone could, and we're really a family, and we've all been together for so yeah. many years and all of that. And, and now we write together, and we sit. We usually actually go to a hotel room cause, to get away from our families <laughs> and, and, and sit and you know watch Shonda Rhimes and then write girls. Yeah. And now, you had um, a lot of experience in writing room, yeah. right? So, Having seen it through her eyes, which is like this is you know that that was your standard. You go yes. into a room and, and network shows were usually what 15, 15 yeah, writers, yeah, yeah. and to see it through her eyes as a beginner, like why do you do it like this? Yes. What are your thoughts on the writer the writing room process now? Because we go through that a lot with when we do a show um, with British writers. It's not something they. Organically. Organically do, do but I, I have had people kind of say, oh that. It's an interesting process. Yeah. So w now that you've gone through it with Lena, what, what are you, what, what's your take on writer's rooms? Well, I mean, in network, it makes so much sense because the, just the volume of things they have to produce. You know, we produced 10 a year. We did 12 once. We asked you to do 12. You said yes. And, and they, then were we, so, <laughs> they were so exhausted. We, we were like, can we go back to 10, Casey? Yes. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I learned, Judd gave me my first 
TV writing job and and on Undeclared, and so I learned from him how to have a writer's room, and his writer's room is a really different scene than other writer's rooms. Like, there's no meritocracy, it's a meritocracy, there's no hierarchy, so it's like, you know, the co-EP doesn't have more of a say than a staff writer. Like, it's really, and even, especially when we started the show, it was basically just group therapy. Yeah. Um, so we run it differently. Um, and smaller than much smaller, yeah. much more intimate, and we don't um, we don't really rewrite in the room. Like we don't gang write episodes, yeah. and we don't put things on a monitor, which is the more traditional way. And right. you're all looking at the script together, and you're you know punching up jokes and things like that. Like even for for punching up, we generally just have the writers do it independently, and right. then give us the copies of the jokes. One of the things I think that you guys have done very well is over the course of seasons, you plot out a season, you have a season arc, right. you know, um, and also episodically uh, stories work, but you, you always have a pretty good season arc. Is there any, you know, as you're coming up with those season arcs, I, I know that, uh, you know, sometimes an idea will get thrown out and maybe you'll go down that path and then abandon it. Is there any, is there any kind of avenue you were headed down and then abandoned that, you know, now looking back, it's like, oh, I'm glad we didn't have uh, Hannah I mean, run off and join the circus. Exactly. Or, you know, like, I mean, I think anything we didn't do, I'm probably glad we <laughs> didn't do. I don't have a lot of regrets <laughs> about those stories. Um, yeah, I think there were, I can't even think of a specific, can you think of a specific one? Because I mean, we most, I will say most of the things you tell us, it, it usually all ends up in there. Right. Um, I, I thought the, the Iowa's Writers Workshop might have ended up being a longer, like I think when we originally talked about it, it was going to yeah, be the whole season. It was going to be the whole right? season, Right, and then it yes. ended up at three episodes. Right. Which I think or worked. Or like, I mean, so HBO's like the greatest collaborative place you could be, and they're much more like a studio than a network. They, um, they're they real creative partners, but this is a good example of uh, Casey. We The first episode of the second, Third season is Jemima in rehab. I can't oh, remember what third. season. I don't remember the second season. And it was originally just Jemima in rehab the whole time. And Casey said, I have one note. And it's it's that I just think you're going to not want to be at rehab that whole time. And we were like, trust us. This is going to be great. No show does this. And then... Um, and then we got to the end of the season, and we were like, we're now doing reshoots. We're adding <laughs> stuff to that story. And Casey was like, well, at least you finally took my note. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, that is, uh, I, I do think to be successful as a network and as a showrunner, it, it definitely helps to have a level of trust. And I think with you guys, we're able to give you our thoughts, and you can agree or disagree, and, and likewise. And I would say over the, over the years, You've been right, we've been right, but... We almost always agree with... I mean, yeah. you come in... I always say this about you. I said this when they call, when you got your promotion, they called for press. I was like, he comes in, he gives one great note, and he leaves, yeah. and you do it. I and it's always great. You, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you got stuff to do. Um, so I, I, another thing I think that you guys have done really successfully is every season, there's one or two episodes that kind of go outside the pattern of storytelling. Right. You know, um, the Patrick Wilson episode when Hannah spends an entire day with Patrick Wilson. Uh, I think Charlie and Marnie this past season, the Beach House episode. Is there one for you that, you know, is your, that stands out to you as your, you know, your, your favorite or? Well, okay, so first I have to confess that as a viewer, I hate those episodes. <laughs> like, I hated when the Facts of Life went to France. <laughs> like, I well, just, like, I don't, I like, I didn't like when Friends went to they London. Went to France? Like, I don't, I want I they everyone went to, to be, no, Friends went to London. Did the Facts of Life, I think they went to France. I think they went to Paris. I did, uh, when Who, Facts of Life. Someone in this room has to know the answer. When Facts of Life got to the candy store, that's, Paris, why, right? that's why I was out. Thank you. Paris. <laughs> Do you think they actually went? Do you, they didn't shoot on not, they didn't so shoot on location. There, no, I'm they? sure they. No, I think they maybe did Was for like a, a couple exteriors. But like, the point is, I just I want people to be on their sets. Like, yeah. I don't want the friends to leave Central Perk. Yeah. Like, the, I, it just. So as a viewer, but as a but writer, those are two multi-cams I love, you're talking about. They are. So. They are. And but even like some people's favorite comfort, episodes yeah. of The Sopranos were not mine. Right. Like, because you weren't with yeah. the normals. Um, but so. That being said, as a writer, it's like the most fun thing you could ever do. Yeah. And a director, like those are the greatest episodes. I mean, 
The Charlie one was really, really fun to do and really, really satisfying, bringing Charlie back. That, right. That was just creatively so, um, that was like such a, you know, closing a circle that we that needed to be closed. Right. And it was great. And I ran into Chris at, you know, I think the Bowery Hotel and he had just done James Wade at Sundance. And, you know, it was just like a really great time. And I said, won't you come back? And Lena wrote the script again in a fever dream, just like she did the Patrick yeah. Wilson one. And, um, and, and he said yes, and it was just a really special thing, I think, for everybody. Um, now, I don't, everybody may not know this, but Jenny directed the ninth, finale, the finale, tenth episode of this past season, and that is the first thing you I directed. Directed. Yeah. How was it? Because I, I was, I was curious about this. Is it now that you've directed? Is it harder to be a writer who learns to direct or a director who learns to write? Um, I mean, I, I think I it's learned to direct. It's all hard, but honestly, I mean. I got to sit next to like the most talented directors in the world for five years and is, watch them do it. So is that, that something was lucky. that you did you want to direct because you watched them and were thinking like, oh, that's interesting. Like when honestly, the reason I wanted to do it, this is really true, is that I was like, I gotta do it. Like I gotta <laughs> try it once. There's like never gonna be a better ex opportunity than true. this. And so that's why I did it, not because I was desperate to direct, because I already felt like as a showrunner, I kind of got to do all the things I wanted to do that are the best parts of directing, working with the actors, you know, giving actors notes, working with the story, all of those things. I didn't, you know, I hate a tech scout. Everyone on my crew knows that. <laughs> so, but, um, but then when I actually did it, I fell in love with it. And it, it, it was, I haven't like learned to do something new in yeah. so long. Like I still don't, I don't ride a hoverboard. Like, you know <laughs> what I mean? Like I haven't, you know, learned any new, I didn't, go to ballet, like I just, it was so great to do something new. Yeah. It was really exciting. And, and I so, had all the help in the world. So you will direct? Uh, yeah, I'm gonna do the series finale. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. um, so again, because it's master class and people wanna hear this stuff, yes. talk a little bit about your becoming a writer, you know, like. How it happened. Yeah, did you always wanna be a writer? Your father's a writer. My father's right? a writer um, and my mother's a writer and I, they did everything they could to make me not want to be a writer. Yeah. Um, and I wasn't for a while. I thought I was going to be a producer. I worked, my very first job was an assistant at Tribeca Films, and I got promoted there to creative executive, and I was like the worst creative executive in the world. <laughs> I would just like take people out on the expense account and be like, so tell me about your life as a writer, you know? <laughs> and, um, and then finally I just decided that if I really wanted to do it, that the job I had was kind of using the same muscle and I wasn't, I just, I'm not one of those, like I got up at 4 a.m. and wrote, you yeah. know? Um, so I quit and tempt and started writing spec scripts. And then- um, What was your, what, or was this in, uh, what would your spec script In have? 1972. <laughs> <laughs> you did it all in the family did, spec? I wrote a Sex in the City. Yeah. And what was the other one? I can't remember what the other one is, but we wrote a Sex in the City. I remember that, and, and then and then we got hired on Undeclared, and and. Um, oh oh! So that was the first. That, that was our first TV job. We had got done it. film stuff before, but got but it. um. But yeah, Undeclared was my first job. So, actually, Judd spoiled me for every other show. Then I went to Network after Undeclared was canceled, and I was like, "This is terrible." <laughs> um, so. You and Lena have kind of branched out into other, you know, beside, uh, uh, besides, you know, other television projects. Can you talk a little bit about Lenny? And yeah. I don't know if you all know, Lenny is a kind of it's news, a feminist newsletter. A feminist newsletter that Jenny and Lena have started. And they're getting like huge interviews that. Um, the, right, like the, the, I don't know if, if um, somewhere you probably read about Jennifer Lawrence. The and pay wage equity. equality, yeah. like that came from us, which was a big coup for us. Um, yeah, we started it, you know, Lena is such a lightning rod, and and it just, everything she says is taken out of context, and she just wanted a context. We wanted a place to, where we could, you know, talk about things we care about, politics, you know, uh, nail art, like yeah. anything. <laughs> and, and It needs to be discussed. Exactly, and, 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 with, you know, in more than 140 characters. So yeah. we, we got it together very quickly 
And um, yeah, we're still under a year old, but you know, we have two. And it wasn't weeks. just Jennifer Lawrence. There were other. There were other. Like yeah, you broke yeah. big stories. What, what were some of the I other mean, ones? I mean, we. You know, I would not say this was like a breaking news story because we don't compete with the news at all right. because we can't. Yeah. And it, so we go a Lenny point of view. Like today, we had. You know, we knew we wanted to talk about the Stanford rape and Brock Turner, but we wanted to do it in a fresh Lenny perspective. So we have Roxanne Gay um, writing about it through the prism of race, which is just like a really different thing that we hadn't seen so far. Um, that literally she tweeted that she wanted to write something about it on race. And I yeah. wrote her immediately and was like, will you do this for Lenny now? Yeah. And she did. So it's interesting um, that you're, you're um I mean, you're creating, but getting out of, uh, not getting out of, but in addition to scripted, you've got a whole other avenue of expression. Yeah, it's really nice to have, because especially when you're doing this kind of personal television, you know, people assume, and sometimes they're right and sometimes they're wrong, that you're just telling your own story. Right. And so it's very nice to be able to actually tell your own story if you want. And also, we're very interested, and we're doing this project with you, the film series, which is all mm -hmm. um, female directors and writers. Yeah. And it's a short film series based on short stories by women. And we're doing that with HBO. And you know, we just want to push the ball forward for women. And we want to help voices that aren't necessarily being heard get heard. So that's the other thing for Lenny, to be a platform for that. Do you, when you kind of look at the comedy landscape, are the things that you, uh, trends you like that are, you know, that you see? Or, you know, things you'd like to see more of, less of? I mean, you know, it's funny because it, like I just heard this, I was getting interviewed this morning and the interviewer told me that the CBC just announced that they're going to like make a huge push to have more female directors and that a big show here, whose name I forgot, Badlands, Wetlands, Heartland, Heartland thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Wetlands um, is the spinoff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're um, working on it. That they've committed to do 50% female directors on, on that show. Mm -hmm. And I mean, so that's a trend that, and maybe another reason to move to Canada. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, but um, you know, that's a trend I'd love to see more of. Um, and from where we sit, because we're at HBO, and because we're friends with so many female showrunners, it feels like the trend is going in a really, the future is female direction. Yeah. And Hillary Clinton's the nominee and all of this. That being said, when I saw, um, I, I will get the statistic wrong, I promise, like I do all of them, like I do television show names, but um, that Hollywood movies, right now studio movies are 2%, it was either 2% or 5% directed by women, which is insane. Yeah. So, you know, I, I want more. Yeah. Um, so let's go back to girls. What are you doing to change the landscape, Casey? Uh, well, you know, um, I'll tell you. He's doing a lot. I would never, no, but honestly, I would never ask this question if I didn't know how much well, he no, was doing. Well, no, it's funny because you asked that because I was just thinking uh, when Richard was here, I don't know if, uh, if the room, if everybody was in the room or we switched out or whatever, but we showed clips from our fall shows. The two half hours uh, divorce is created by Sharon Horgan. Um, My and, obsession. Uh, and <laughs> stars Sarah Jessica Parker. And Insecure is uh, created by and stars Issa Rae and directed by a first-time um, narrative director, uh, African-American woman named Melina Masukas. So that's right. what I'm doing. Good. <laughs> Keep doing what but you're yes. doing. Yeah. Um, so back to, uh, back to girls. The last season, how... How are you processing it? I mean, I still, I, I know we were, uh, we're trying to figure out like when the last table reads are, and I'm like, it's just so odd. So how, how as you look back on it, it still, it still does, I mean, Jenny and I, during the pilot, would say to each other, like, when's the other shoe gonna drop? It just went so smoothly. Yes. And it, and it truly has, uh, through the entire yeah, run, yeah, it. knock on wood, it's all gonna <laughs> fall apart. Um, it has gone very smoothly and, and um, has been a really creatively fulfilling experience, I think, for everybody involved. Yeah. You, you guys felt like six seasons was a good. Well, if you remember, run. originally we thought you were going to do five. Seasons, I remember, yeah. And then you and Mike were like, "Don't you have more to say?" Yeah. And so we added the sixth do you feel, during the fourth season. We had yeah. that conversation, and I'm really glad we did. Yeah. So it feels like the right. Yeah, it feels like the right amount of time. I mean, it's called Girls, you know. Yeah. 
Dan Herman said to me last night, just slap a golden on the front of it. Keep going forever. <laughs> so, hmm, let's yeah, think about that. I know. Yeah. I mean, it's so funny because Murray, who's one of our writers, um, says literally every day, this is the best job in the world. Why would you want to end it? But, yeah. you know, it's, you got to, all good things must come to an end. So it's very bittersweet. Yeah. And the actors, you know, are saying things like, was that my last sex scene I'm ever going to shoot? And they're, they're romanticizing some strange stuff. But I, I will say also, probably, you know, as a, as a testament to you and Lena and Judd, it, um, you know, a lot of times, everybody here has been involved in television, a lot of times sets can get, you know, uh, there's infighting, yeah. work, isn't it? Nothing. I know, it's crazy. And considering they were all women in their early 20s when we yeah. started the show, it's like a miracle. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we just got lucky. And, you know, it comes from the top. And Lena is, like, the most generous collaborative person. And, you know, she's writing, directing. She's naked in a scene. It's 4 a.m. And she's asking the makeup woman how her night is going. Yeah. You know, she's just a generous, lovely person. And so it doesn't give people a lot of room to misbehave, even if they would. Right. And right. I think people felt really lucky. I did every day. You know, yeah. I still feel like it's the best job in the world. Yeah. Should we not? What do you think? Should we do like one more season? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, so, so I think, I don't know. I just... I mean, because great, I wish that it was, there was a corollary where it's like, the show is so fun to make and it has to be good because of that. Because yeah. there are plenty of, some of my favorite shows in the world had really combative sets. Yeah. Um, but, so it's not really a correlation, but how lovely to. I, I, do, I think you're right, it comes way. from the top down. I mean, yeah. it, it's what you will tolerate. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, I think we're gonna do a Q and A. Q and A. Um, Should I ask you some questions? You first? can ask me questions. The crowd can ask whatever they want. I love Q and A's because I, I will say, like even when I, when we do them at HBO with interns, you know, summer interns, someone will say like, "Why did you do that show?" And I'll be like, "I don't know." Yeah. You know, it's like, <laughs> like no one's asked me that before. So I think it's you know I think it's good for. Well, why did you do Girls? Well, it, that's a good you know it's funny because um, if you look at the history of HBO in comedy specifically, we've always done really well with um, writer, performer, directors. And what I like yeah. to say in, in, in Half Hour is if you at least get two of the three. Yeah. You know, like Armando Iannucci is a writer, director, Mike Judge, writer, director, yeah. uh, Issa Rae, um, writer, performer. I'd argue that Sex in the City was a hit, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, 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 I know, but I'm yeah, saying, yeah. I'm just saying, like. Yeah, yeah, it's a great it, it, Larry Sanders, yeah. you know, it, it, because I think. For HBO, Larry our, our David. tone, Larry David, um, our tone is so, with comedies, the tone can be so specific. And I, when I think some, when somebody is controlling at least two of those three things, writer, performing, directing, the tone continues to, you know, it, you can control that really well. And then I think, you know, Lena is, is, as you say, like she was wholly unique. I don't think anybody had seen anything like her. I loved how daring she was about her body. Yeah. You know, um, because, if you can imagine, from Sex in the City, you know, when it went off the air, there was a lot of like, well, we should do, you know, a show about, you know, young women in urban right. settings, you know, just right. like, and I can't even imagine taking the girl script and casting it. Right. I mean, it would be, yeah, it, would be it crazy. wouldn't be the same I remember show. <laughs> she was so green when we first started. I remember at some point her saying, Judd said something to her like, we were talking about casting the Marnie role, and he's like, it's got to be like a real opposite kind of person or something, and something triggered in her that she called me, and she was like, am I getting fired? <laughs> and I was like, you can't get fired. Well, we're making the show about you. <laughs> it's funny, on, on the pilot, I, the, uh, the girls' pilot was the first time Judd had done TV since Undeclared, Undeclared, and I remember he called me, and we were talking about casting, and he was like, I'm going to cast the people I want. And I yeah. was like, I know. Yeah. You're like, you're calm like, down. This is HBO. <laughs> yeah, gonna, I said, you're going to get to yeah. cast who you want. I was like, oh, you know, he had a lot of like. Defensive. Uh, it, yeah, it was not. A lot of wo network wounds. Yes. yes. And so we've. Um, but we all come to HBO to heal. <laughs> yes, we've, we've healed those wounds. So, um, uh, yeah. Um, so, can we do QA? Please ask questions. Ask My us big questions. fear about QA is that people don't have questions. Hi, 
Sorry, did you hear any of that? I, to begin I with? did, okay. but you could repeat it for everybody <laughs> okay, else. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to say, as a obviously very accomplished showrunner, what advice would you have to aspiring creatives who are facing geographical challenges in today's environment, aside from creating own content and using social media? Do you have any other advice to offer? I mean, the thing I would say to anybody, and I, this doesn't really address the geographical issue so much, but is that I think um, just just write and write and write. And one mistake I've seen people make in in the beginning is hold on too tightly to a script, and like people just clutch onto a script and think I, it's I the, find that a lot the only yeah. work that is ever going to be good. And the truth is, especially in television, you gotta let go, and the next thing will be better. And I really believe that like Matt Weiner ruined this for everyone because he held on to Mad Men and then it turned out to be one of the greatest shows of all time. <laughs> and so he but, like he, but he, he did do it after being lesson. on Sopranos for a long yes, time. Yes, he did. Right. He did. So yes. I, I, I find that a lot with people who are starting out. They go, "This script is amazing," and my yeah. advice is usually, "You know what? Take that script, put it in a drawer, and exactly. write something else." I mean, all the time. And yeah. and so that that is to me the biggest lesson I think is to just keep writing and keep writing and don't be precious about your work. Thanks. Oh, OK. So one of my questions uh, to you is, could you speak to Lena's comfort with being nude? Sure. It's like she was a bit of a shock first off. My husband was, was not thrilled with that. So, um, <laughs> well, the good news for your husband is he doesn't have to uh, watch well, it. It was a different look on television for. for it was. Yes, um, and it was like, and she was just so comfortable with it. Could you talk to that? I mean, I, I think you know, it. It always. It's funny when people call her brave for it. It always kind of irritates me, um, because the truth is, is that she's brave about so many things, and. Before she made girls, she made tiny furniture, and and being naked was just part of her work. It's just it's like asking someone why they use watercolors over oils. It's just part of her creative process. You know, anyone who takes it as an aggressive act is um, taking it too personally. I think I think it's just it's just her art, and and you know I think that nothing could be better than people being able to see real human bodies on television and. You know. Real human bodies. That's the yeah. Yeah. It's just it's not, and everyone has a real human body on that show in some way. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's like, and 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 we see, you know, Peter Scolari's body, and we see that was the first penis. That's right. We, we saw. saw him naked. In, yes. <laughs> naked. In and the we shower, see Becky right? Ann Baker's boobs. Like people get naked, and we always, you know, I always say about girls, like it's the show where. When someone else would end when you walked into the bathroom, we follow you in. Like yeah. our executive producer Eileen Landra spends so like makes fun of us so much because we probably built 25 bathrooms <laughs> because we shoot so many things there because that is where women talk to each other in an intimate way, and you know and and talk to men in an intimate way. And so it's just been like, you know, we just we're we're always trying to push further. Like and and so to see that nudity is just humanity, I think. Yeah. Yes. So Jenny, um, you said that, you mentioned that uh, um, you're going to direct the uh, season, uh, sorry, series fina finale. And as a showrunner, um, can you talk about the, the, are there specific things that you want to address or make sure the performance is right on the characters or like, you could direct any episode, but uh, yeah, the, it's the last of It's true. Video. I mean, part of that is honestly scheduling, because we'll be completely done with all the scripts by then, God willing. And so there's that. But also, um, I just wanted to sort of be a part of the directing the last one, because I think it's going to be really emotional. And um, I mean, I just think as we go into the sixth season, one, one of the things that we've always tried to talk about is tried to show a realistic portrait of young women's relationships, which are really messy. And you know, there are shows where you go, oh, well, you know they're all going to wind up being friends with each other. And I think our show isn't one of those shows. And we're sort of exploring this time in people's lives, which is like, you're friends with people after college. 
just kind of as a given, you stay friends, but are those the people you're meant to spend your life with? We don't know. And so that's the exploration of the final season. I had, a, I had two questions, actually. I was wondering um, about the influence of other writers. Um, Lena's writing always reminds me of like Sheila Hetty's How Should a Person Be, or yes. even Alice Munro, The Lives of Women and Girls, yeah. which were my Those are all big Canadian influences for her. Those writers. are, yeah. So I'm wondering about who, what novels and that kind of thing you guys are looking at. And then the second is a question about the art direction. One of the things I like about Alice Munro's books is she often is preoccupied with very feminine things like shoes. Sorry, can you just repeat that last one? One of my favorite things about Alice Munro and those writers is that they're feminists, but often like very pre preoccupied by feminine things like shoes or, and also the self-hatred that comes with being preoccupied with that kind right. of stuff. <laughs> right. And um, in Lena's show, I, in your show, I can't help but notice like the incubator looks like a dollhouse or um, all of the giant shoes that are in the shot. So I wanted to ask you about what novelists influence the writing and about the art direction of the show. Well, I mean, the writers you just mentioned are definitely influences, and Lena's big fans of all of those people. Um, you know, Nora Ephron has been a huge influence, and even though I think our work is very different from hers, her essays have been a big influence on us. Um, Susan Sontag is a big influence, and Judd has been a huge influence. I mean, he's he's been my mentor for years, and he was the first person who ever said to me, like, there is no value in writing if you're not writing truthfully, which doesn't mean you have to like say what you did yesterday, but you have to be honest in your portrayal of characters. And you know, he's, you know, people wouldn't always assume this, but he's the one who pushes us so deeply into the romance of the show. That's sort of his like, the funny surprising area of Judd is that, you know we're the ones writing the disgusting, terrible sex scenes, and <laughs> he's the one saying, but where's the love? Where's yeah. the romance? You know, let's have Adam run across town to save Hannah, that kind of thing. And then the art you know, And then the, the art direction. I mean, you know, it was a tricky thing when we started because we do care about clothes and care about shoes, but also Sex and the City had done that so brilliantly and so perfectly. And, and in such an aspirational way. So we kind of had to know that that existed and figure out like a new thing to do. And part of it was being completely non-aspirational. I mean, I am so surprised when people are like, where's Hannah's shirt from? Because like, first of all, it has lizards all over it or something <laughs> like plastic lizards sewn to it. But also, you know, our wardrobe department literally specifically tailors things so they fit her less well. If something fits her really well, we'll use it for like, a fancy party scene or something like that, but if we're just doing normal day-to-day -day Hannah, it's like, that looks too good, and we'll start to adjust it. It changes a little as the seasons go on, but at the beginning, I remember getting like an urgent call from Judd of the scene, we were shooting the scene, it was our first day of shooting the we're the ladies scene, where there's, the girls are all sitting on the bench talking about who are the mm -hmm. ladies, and Judd called and he was like, she looks too good. We gotta <laughs> fix this problem. Um, and in terms of the art direction, I mean, I had never thought of that, the incubator looking like a dollhouse or anything like that. And that may be something that our brilliant Matt Munn has thought of himself and come to, but that's just like a lucky, a lucky special coincidence. And thank you for noticing. <laughs> Anybody? I don't see that. Oh, there you go. I was just curious um, about the scene where Hannah was reading a story at the Moth. Yes. With the shot that was like around three minutes. Yes. How long um, did, how many times did it, how many, how many times how many did, we shoot did you it? do and like how did that come together? When we were scouting. Wait, which, which It's scene? the shot, you know when she does the Moth story we don't cut away. Oh yeah, it's yeah, It's just yeah, a yeah. really, the slowest yes. motion in the world. Um, and when we were scouting, um, I came up with the idea with the help of Jesse Peretz, who's sort of our in-house director, producer. And, and we came up with the idea of the push. And the great news about being in the fifth season of the show and being the showrunner when you're directing is that you can go, and I'm not going to get any coverage. I'm just doing that, and that's I'm committing to this. You can't be mad at anybody yeah, in the edit Yeah, exactly. Room. And I was just like, that's what we're doing. So we shot it, I think we shot it like four or five times 
Lena was incredible every single time. Maybe we shot it three times. She was incredible every single time, so much so that the audience would applaud, the audience of extras applauded spontaneously after each time she did it. And I think the only reason we shot more than one was for safety and because like once she forgot two lines of dialogue or something. But she was really, that was like a real, she's incredible like that. It's not really a question. I just wanted to say I love the show and how groundbreaking it is. And Thank it's you. wonderful to see women in different different roles. Like different I love the Hamptons episode when she spent the whole episode in her bikini yeah. with the little t shirt on. And you know, it's it's I think it's a great message for women just to be themselves and yeah. to feel comfortable in their own skin. So it's a really positive well, thank thing. Thank you. Lena definitely does, you know, she really does feel she she, I mean, she would be in bikini the whole weekend. She <laughs> feels really comfortable doing that, and not she'll do it for comedy, a hundred percent. But she also is someone who is really comfortable with her body, and I think that's like so lucky of a message to be able to take into the world. You know, that just reminded me one thing. I, one thing I wanted to say. You mentioned this last night, or I think you made a passing reference to it. I don't think the show gets enough credit for being as funny as it is. No. Oh. Because I, you know, like some right. people will categorize it in the dramedy category, yeah, yeah. And, and believe me, I've done, you know, like Enlightened was a full-on, yeah, yeah, half-hour drama. It was great, yeah. but the show really is funny, and I think you guys don't get the credit you deserve for well, as funny. We are doing a master is. class in I, That's why I know. That's why I'm saying <laughs> it needs to be pointed out. Right. Oh, you thank know? you. Um, thank you. Sorry well, that. it's hard because, like, you know, Veep is a show that has so much humanity. And so much well, realism. It not, does. Not but that I, much humanity. It is. <laughs> no, it I mean, they're real characters, but yeah, it's yes, a different tone for real sure. They're real characters, but like that is just wall to wall jokes. Yeah. It's incredible. I'm like, I can't imagine how they do it. Yeah. It's amazing. That show, like, literally, I laugh out loud for 28 minutes. Right. But I, th you know, you guys do, right. you, you know, more than, more than I think is acknowledged. Well, so. thank you. In my opinion. Thank you. He agrees. Thank you. <laughs> thank Thanks, you. guys. Oh, we have to wrap it up? Okay. I think we're almost one. Should Thank we do one more? Sure. One? OK. One more. One more question, then I'll tell you guys a little announcement, and then we'll go. OK. Oh, yeah. Hi. Um, I have a question about, um, kind of about Lena, kind of about everybody. Um, I've noticed that there's a really cool thing that you guys do with um, like characters who are artists, like with Booth Jonathan. And um, Mimi Who's Rose, Jonathan? and Mimi Rose Howard, and the art that they do on the show, like their characters, is so funny and accurate. Like yeah. the um, the CRT uh, TV like trap thing, yeah. and then also like Mimi Rose's um, like Who Am I? Who yeah, her like, performance. Like it's so spot on, but and so funny, and I wonder like. Does that come from Lena being like, oh, my parents are artists and I can kind of make fun of this stuff? Or is it just everybody like piling on and be like, this is so funny, it's so like masturbatory? Well, I mean, I think it does come from, you know, we started Marnie in the art world. That was her first job. So, but I, I think the reason we try to be pretty authentic in the work and not too jokey is because Lena has to answer to her parents at the end of the day, and it has to look real. And we yeah. trust me, we've gotten some rough notes from her dad. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we're doing we're doing the best we can. But you know, we have this incredible art department, and they build those works, and they're amazing. Um, all right, so I think we have to wrap it up, but I'll tell everybody here because you're at a master of comedy class. Um, one thing we're announcing uh, now is that we're going to do uh, HBO is going to do another season of Curb Your Enthusiasm. So. Yay! So, That's such good news. Yeah, so we're just he's blasting. Ready. He's, he's ready. He's ready. He's ready. He's come back and said he's got something. So okay. we just made that announcement. So that's going out. And I, you can make Dave Mandel and Alec Berg available. <laughs> well, that's yeah. We got to work that out. <laughs> um, anyway, thank you, thank you, Jenny. Thank you, guys. Last night, Casey was like, "We're just going to wing it." We're going to wing like it. Four hundred. <laughs>